Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today because it is the end of August. Can you believe it? We're almost in September. I, For as crazy as 2020 has been, I guess at least it's trying to fly by quickly and yet it doesn't feel like anything has changed. So I don't really know <laughs> what to think about that. But anyway, because it's the end of the month, it is time for a book haul. And I've been having smaller book hauls throughout 2020 because, you know, with the global pandemic, money has been a little bit tighter than it was last year, but plus, just in general, I, I want to try to focus on some of the stuff I have rather than bring in a whole lot more. But this month, I have a sizable amount of books to talk about, which is fun and yet didn't break the bank either, but we'll talk about that as we get through. Two of the books I'm going to talk about are from the Booker Prize long list. I have my reaction to it. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, I will link it down below. And two of the books immediately jumped out as something that I really, really want to read. Now, last year when they announced the long list, the book that jumped out to me so much that I immediately ordered it was Girl, Woman, Another. And that went on to co-win the prize. Will it happen to one of these? Only time will tell. The first one is not actually one of those Booker books, but it is something I ordered because of one of those Booker books. It is Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga. This is the first in the trilogy that concludes with This Mournable Body. And I decided, it was one of the books that really jumped out to me and I had to order, but since it's part of a trilogy, I wanted to get the first installment. Oddly, I didn't get the second one because I felt like I need to try the first one, see if I like it, and get the foundation, but I didn't order the second, but I did order the third. I can't explain myself. I really can't. But uh, both of these were actually available as used books in the UK immediately after the long list was announced. So I got them for dirt cheap, which is really nice. This is an older edition from Seal Press, and I believe it was published, this was done in 2004, but the book itself was published in 1998. So it's, um, the, the trilogy itself has spanned a lot of time. But this really jumped out as something that I want to try, and I'm very excited to get to it. Let's do the description. This stunning classic novel set in colonial Rhodesia during the 1960s centers on the coming of age of a teenage girl, Tambu, and her relationship with her British-educated cousin, Nyasha. Tambu, who yearns to be free of the constraints of her rural village, especially the circumscribed lives of the women, thinks her dreams have come true when her wealthy uncle offers to sponsor her education but she soon learns that the training she receives at his mission school comes with a price. She meets the worldly and rebellious Nyasha, chafing under her father's authority. Raised in England, Nyasha is a stranger among her own people, and Tambu can only watch as her cousin, caught between two cultures, pays the full cost of alienation. I mean, it sounds like an amazing book, so I'm really looking forward to this. If you follow along, you know that I usually read the first sentence when I do a book haul. And I think for this, I'm, I, last month I experimented with reading a little bit more than just the first sentence, and I'm going to try that as well. So the first sentence of Nervous Conditions is, I was not sorry when my brother died, nor am I apologizing for my callousness, as you may define it, my lack of feeling, for it is not that at all. Really looking forward to this. Now, as I said, I did not get the second book in the series, but I did get This Mournable Body, which is, I believe, the third. I believe there are only three. And I have the first and the third, but not the middle. So in this tense and psychologically charged novel, Tsitsi Dangaremga channels the hope and potential of one young woman and a fledgling nation to lead us on a journey to discover where lives go after hope has departed. Here we join Tambu, living in a rundown youth hostel in downtown Harar, anxious about her prospects after leaving a stagnant job. In her attempts to make a life for herself, she is faced with fresh humiliation at every turn until the painful contrast between the future she imagined and her daily reality ultimately drives her to the breaking point. 30 years on from her acclaimed debut, Nervous Conditions, considered one of the 100 books that shaped the world by the BBC, that award-winning Zimbabwean author Tsitsi Dangaremga has produced another masterpiece. And I'm really looking forward to this as well. I'm just very excited to get to it. Uh, it has a quote from Lorraine Hansberry in the beginning. Let's do the first sentence or two or three. There is a fish in the mirror. The mirror is above the wash basin in the corner of your hostile room. The tap, cold only in the rooms, is dripping. And there you go. That is this mournable body. So this is an older one from Seal Press. This one is obviously newer and it is from Faber and Faber. 
I mentioned last month, I want to try to pay a little bit closer attention to the publishers that are pushing putting these books out because I feel like it's good to give acknowledgement to publishers who, especially because some of these books are uh, diverse authors and that is a really good thing to celebrate. And speaking of which, I got a copy of The Yield by Tara June Winch. This is published by Harper Via. And I'm really excited for this. Jacqueline from Six Minutes for Me has been talking about this. And it sounds like a really good, fascinating book. As part of my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone Challenge, I need want to try to hit an author from every continent. And I've already done Australia, but I think it would be worthwhile to go back to Australia. And uh, this book really talks about uh, Aboriginal life in Australia, which is something I haven't really explored in literature. And I think its representation in literature is fairly new. So I'm very excited about this. After 10 years adrift in Europe, running from things she'd rather forget and searching for something she cannot name, August Gondowindi is called home for her grandfather's memorial. She returns to the rural Australian town of Massacre Plains, racked with grief and burdened with all she tried to leave behind, only to find that those she left are in trouble. Prosperous House, where her nan and pop have lived for decades, raising their kids and then their grandkids, will be repossessed and destroyed by a mining company, leaving her nan with nothing unless August can find a way to stop it. Determined to make amends for leaving and to right history's wrongs, August endeavors to save her family's home and her ancestors' land, but something is missing. A book her grandfather was writing before he died that might hold the key to blocking the mine. Can she find it in time, and is she ready to face the truths it will uncover? Told in three masterfully woven narratives, The Yield is a powerful reclaiming of indigenous birthrights and an offering of hope for the future. Sold, sold, and sold. Again, it's not just... I'm really looking forward to getting this book in. And it has a map. I love a book with a map. I was born in Nurembang. Can you hear it? Nurembang. If you say it right, it hits the back of your mouth and you should taste blood in your words. And that is an intriguing start to The Yield by Tara June Winch. Now, that book, I had talked to someone at one of my local indies about that book. Uh, earlier in the year, and when they finally got it in, they actually called me and said that they were holding a copy, so I, I went and I got it. While I was there, they asked me if I had heard of this book, Filthy Beasts by Kirkland Hamill. It's a memoir, and I hadn't, but I read the flap, and they nailed me. It sounds like a very me book, and I just, I, I, I love supporting bookstores and publishers, and I, I think, especially when a when a, books, a bookseller knows you well enough to recommend something that seems perfectly you, I felt like I just had to do it. Why is it perfectly me? Because it's a gripping, true riches to rags tale of a wealthy family who lost it all and the unforgettable journey of a man coming to terms with his family's deep flaws and his own long buried truths. Wake up, you filthy beasts, Wendy Hamill would shout to her children in the mornings before school. Startled from their dreams, Kirk and his two brothers couldn't help but wonder, would they find enough food in the house for breakfast? Following a rancorous split from New York's upper-class society, newly divorced Wendy and her three sons are exiled from the East Coast elite circle. Wendy's middle son, Kirk, is eight when she moves the family to her native Bermuda, leaving the three boys to fend for themselves as she chases after the highs of her old life, alcohol, a wealthy new suitor, and other indulgences. After eventually leaving his mother's dysfunctional orbit for college in New Orleans, Kirk begins to realize how different his family and upbringing are from that of his peers and friends. Split between extreme pri privilege, early years living in luxury on his family's private compound, and bare survival, rationing food and water during the height of his mother's alcoholism, Kirk is used, used to keeping up appearances and burying his inconvenient truths from the world until he's 18 and falls in love for the first time. A fascinating window into a life of extreme privilege and a powerful story of self-acceptance Filthy Beasts recounts Kirk's unforgettable journey through luxury hotels and charity stores, private enclaves, and pri public shame as he confronts his family's many imperfections, accepts his unconventional childhood, and finally comes to terms with his own hidden secrets. I don't know how a book could be more me, because it's a, it's a memoir that kind of interrogates the past and how somebody became who they are, and is very reflective. That is so, so me. It's about a complicated family, which I love. I also love complicated family stories where uh, wealth and privilege goes wrong. Like The Royal Tenenbaums is one of my favorite movies, so this is such a me book, and it has an LGBTQ angle because when they talk about his struggle towards self-acceptance, they're talking about his sexual uh, identity. And I'm really excited to read this book, and I'm thrilled to pieces that somebody knew me well enough to recommend it to me. 
When I tell people stories about my mother, as I tend to do, people sometimes ask me how long she's been gone. I think back to the spring day in 1982 when I asked her to drive me into town and she got into the car with a full glass of scotch, wearing the sunglasses that she never took off, and she chewed her nails nervously as she tried to figure out how to start the engine. And again, I'm hooked. This is published by Avid Reader Press, and I'm really looking forward to it. Then we have my two book of the month picks. I, I picked two. One of them is Luster by Raven Leilani. I have heard a lot of really great things about this book, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Edie is stumbling through her 20s, sharing a subpar apartment in Bushwick, clocking in and out of her admin job, making a series of inappropriate sexual choices. She is also haltingly, fitfully giving heat and air to the air art that simmers inside her. And then she meets Eric, a digital archivist with a family in New Jersey, including an autopsist wife who has agreed to an open marriage with rules. As if na navigating the constantly shifting landscapes of contemporary sexual manners and racial politics weren't hard enough, Edie finds herself unemployed and invited into Eric's home, though not by Eric. She becomes a hesitant ally to his wife and a de facto role model to his adopted daughter. Edie may be the only black, black woman young Akilah knows. Irresistibly unruly and strikingly beautiful, razor sharp and slightly comic, Raven Lilani's luster is a portrait of a young woman trying to make sense of her life, her hunger, her anger, in a tumultuous era. It is also a haunting, aching depiction of how hard it is to believe in your own talent and of the unexpected influences that bring us into ourselves. It's old. I mean, it's a, kind of a classic coming-of-age novel about somebody who can't really get their life together in their early 20s, but it's told by and through a person of color, which puts enough of a spin in it. It really looks at it, it seems to really look at it from a more contemporary angle, and I'm just fascinated, and I really can't wait to get to this book. Here we go. The first time we have sex, we are both fully clothed at our desks during work hours, bathed in blue computer light. And I'm going to leave it there for now. <laughs> Interesting beginning. And then another book of the month pick. It is The Death of Vivek OG by Akweke Amazie. I have not read anything by Akweke Amazie before, but uh, she is an author who is on my TBR and who I'm really looking forward to. So when I saw this, I had to snap it up. And it sounds fascinating. Oh, I completely forgot. Luster is published by FSG. And I love FSG, so... No surprise there. One afternoon in a town in southeastern Nigeria, a mother opens her front door to discover her son's body wrapped in colorful fabric at her feet. What follows is the tumultuous, heart-wrenching story of one family's struggle to understand a child whose spirit is both gentle and mysterious. Raised by a distant father and a compassionate but overprotective mother, Vivek Oji suffers disorienting blackouts, moments of disconnection between self and surroundings. As adolescence leads to adulthood, Vivek finds solace in friendships with the warm, boisterous daughters of the Niger wives, foreign-born women married to Nigerian men. But Vivek's close bond is with Osita, the worldly, high-spirited cousin whose teasing confidence masks a guarded private life. As their relationship deepens and Osita struggles to understand Vivek's escalating crisis, the mystery gives way to a heart-stopping act of violence in a moment of exhilarating freedom. I mean, it sounds like a really fascinating book. I've heard that Akweke Emeze's previous books have been a bit of a, kind of like a Marmite book. People either love them or they really hate them, but I'm very excited to give them a try. Oh, chapter one is actually only one sentence, so let's do that. They burned down the market on the day Vivek OG died. And this is published by Riverhead Books, another really great publisher, so you know it's got to be good. Then there were three books that I, I got at Fact and Fiction, the store uh, that is on my t-shirt because they celebrated their birthday over the weekend. Their birthday was actually in March, but because of the pandemic, they were closed. So they decided to celebrate their birthday late and have a sale. So I got all three of these books fairly cheap, but I wanted to make sure I supported them. And the first one is Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart, which is the other Booker Prize winner that I had been wanting to, to purchase and actually did not know was officially released in the US yet. So when I saw it, at Fact and Fiction books, I had to snap it up because it is the other book that immediately grabbed me so much that it was like, yes, I have to read that. I have to read that. So, Shuggy Bane is the unforgettable story of young Hugh Shuggy Bane, a sweet and lonely boy who spends his 1980s childhood in a rundown public housing in Glasgow, Scotland. 
It is a difficult place to grow up, with men out of work as the coal mines close and a drug epidemic waiting in the wings. Shugi's mother Agnes walks a wayward path. She is Shugi's guiding light, but a burden for him and his siblings. She dreams of a house with its own front door while she flicks through the pages of the Freeman's catalog, ordering something to brighten up her gray life. Married to a philandering taxi driver husband, Agnes keeps her pride by looking good. Her beehive, makeup, and pearly white false teeth suggest a Glaswegian Elizabeth Taylor. But Agnes is an alcoholic, and she drains away the lion's share of each week's benefits, all the family has to live on, on cans of extra strong lager hidden in handbags and bottles of vodka poured into tea mugs. Agnes's older children find their own ways to get a safe distance from their mother, leaving Shuggy to care for her. He is meanwhile struggling to somehow become the normal boy he desperately longs to be, but everyone has realized that he is no right, a boy with a secret that all but he can see. And of course, the secret is that he is gay, from what I understand. So, complicated family? Check. LGBTQ angle? Check. Teaches me about something I, do. I know about uh, the coal miner strikes and all that, but I, I would always be willing to learn more. So it teaches me something. This book just checks a lot of my boxes, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. In fact, I am planning a buddy read with someone later this year. This is published by Grove Press, by the way. And the beginning is The day was flat. The, that morning his mind had abandoned him and left his body wandering down below. The empty body went listlessly through its routine, pale and vacant-eyed under the fluorescent strip lights, as his soul floated above the aisles and thought only of tomorrow. Tomorrow was something to look forward to. And there you go. That is Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. Coming close to the end. This one is actually something we got for my husband because he is actually listening to the audio of this right now. Um, Robert from Barter Hordes had mentioned this book to me and it sounded like something my husband would like, so I mentioned it to him and we were looking at the book and because it has maps and photos and things like that, we decided, and since it was Fact and Fiction's birthday, we snapped it up. It's Labyrinth of Ice, The Triumphant and Tragic Greeley Polar Expedition by Buddy Levy. This is something that I would be interested in reading at some point, but we did get it specifically for him. So, in July 1881, Lieutenant A.W. Greeley and his crew of 24 scientists and explorers were bound for the last region unmarked on global maps. Their goal? Farthest north. What would follow was one of the most extraordinary and terrible voyages ever made. Greeley and his men confronted every possible challenge, vicious wolves, sub-zero temperatures, and months of total darkness, And as they set about one of the most remote, unrelenting environments on the planet. In May 1882, they reached their target, the northernmost point ever attained, and returned to camp to eagerly await the resupply ships scheduled to return at the end of the year. Only nothing came. 250 miles south, a wall of ice prevented any rescue from reaching them. Provisions thinned, and a second winter descended. Back home, Greeley's wife worked tirelessly against government resistance to rally a rescue mission. Months passed, and Greeley made a drastic choice. He and his men loaded the remaining provisions and tools onto their five small boats, and pushed off into the treacherous waters. After just two weeks, dangerous flows surrounded them. Now new dangers awaited, insanity, threats of mutiny, and cannibalism. As food dwindled and the men weakened, Greeley's expedition clung desperately to life. And it sounds like a kind of bleak book, a little bit of an unhappy book, but it's also a really interesting story, and it's a very well put together book. Like I said, there are lots of maps, and illustrations, and photographs, so very much looking forward to this at some point. My husband is currently reading it. He's, he's decided he's going to read the book uh, along with the audio. And this is published by St. Martin's Press. Prologue. Expedition Commander Lieutenant Adolphus W. Greeley stood on the edge of the ice flow listening to the constant groan and roar of the ice pack, a sound so eerily hideous that it had come to be known by Arctic explorers as the Devil's Symphony. Devil's Symphony would have actually been a fun title as well. And then the final thing that I purchased at Fact and Fiction and just overall in the month of August is Hamnet, a novel of the plague by Maggie O'Farrell. If you follow along, you know that I just finished this book and I loved this book. I had read it on NetGalley. It is published by Knopf and it's so good. I really loved it. It is definitely gonna be one of my favorite books of the year definitely in the top two, possibly top three, depending on how the rest of the reading year goes.
but I, it's it's so good. I just really wanted to have a copy of it on my shelf, so I picked it up. If you are unfamiliar, I just dropped a bunch of cards. <laughs> England 1580, the Black Death creeps across the land, an ever-present threat, infecting the healthy, the sick, the old, and the young alike. The end of days is near, but life always goes on. A young Latin tutor, penniless and bullied by a violent father, falls in love with an extraordinary, eccentric young woman. Agnes is a wild creature who walks her family's land with a falcon on her glove and is known throughout the countryside for her unusual gifts as a healer, understanding plants and potions better than she does people. Once she settles with her husband in, on Henley Street in Stratford-upon-Avon, she becomes a fiercely protective mother and a steadfast centrifugal force in the life of her young husband, whose career on the London stage is just taking off when his beloved young son, son succumbs to sudden fever. A luminous portrait of a marriage, a shattering evocation of a family ravaged by grief and loss, and a tender and unforgettable reimagining of a boy whose life has been all but forgotten and whose name was given to one of the most celebrated plays of all time, Hamnet is mesmerizing, seductive, impossible to put down, magnificently forward from one of our most gifted novelists. So in case you can't tell, Agnes's husband is William Shakespeare. He is not named in the book, and what, that was one of the things that was really interesting about this book, but I'm not going to go into a whole lot about it and just say that I loved this book, and I have already read it. Um, but I just want to have it on my shelf, and I kind of wanted to, to have a copy to hold up <laughs> as I talk, because I know I will be talking about this book a lot throughout the rest of 2020. It's so good. And it is very beautifully put together. It has deckled edges, and I'm not a huge fan of those. But hey, other, it's, other than that, it is a beautiful book. And the beginning is, A boy is coming down a flight of stairs. The passage is narrow and twists back on itself. He takes each step slowly, sliding himself along the wall, his boots meeting each tread, with a thud. And there you go, that's the beginning to Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. So those are the, I think, nine books that I brought into my library in the month of August. I would love to hear thoughts. If you've read any of those, any that I should maybe stay away from, put off, or any I need to really urgently get to, I would encourage you to urgently get to Hamnet if you have not already. And I'd love to hear what you brought into your library in the month of August as well. Incidentally, my library is actually, I, I was looking into whether or not they were going to reopen and it looks like they are, my library is actually, was going to open, but they are in the process of moving into their new building. So it's going to be a while for that, but uh, I look forward to supporting them when they reopen. And anyway, as always, I really appreciate your time watching this video. It's always fun to have new books to talk about. And if you've made it this far, thank you. I will be back until next time. Happy reading.